the new world. Now, according to standard history, folk, the American Indians are Oriental, and they crossed from Asia into Alaska, crossed the Bering Straits during the last ice age. When the ocean here would have been frozen solid, they had firm ice to walk on. The woolly mammoth also crossed, that's why I find a lot of woolly mammoths up here and over here both. Several animals crossed. That's the standard view. I don't buy it. No Indian told the story about it either. The Indians, when you ask them, where do you come from, they always said, we crossed the seas in a boat many, many years ago. Uh, and uh, it is now known that you can cross the ocean in a rowboat. You can cross the ocean in a kayak. You can live off dried food for days on end. And there are certain ways to separate salt from water. And also, if you know where to look, there are certain places in the ocean where the water is not as salty as it is at other places. Freshwater springs shoot up. And uh, I've heard particularly around here, there's some fresh water even in the middle of the ocean. Uh, you cannot fish very well in the middle of the ocean, though. Fish don't bite. Uh, don't ask me why. Maybe because the ocean is so deep and you don't put a line down 15,000 feet, but whatever, if fishing is not usually very good except along the shorelines. Now, if you think differently or no better, I'm just going by what I've read. Um, there are, again, alternate views. So yes, you can also cross the Pacific Ocean. And there's no doubt that the, a lot of the American Indians are Oriental. But if you study the DNA of American Indians, you'll find that some of their DNA is Caucasian even. Some of it is definitely Mongolian, Chinese, Mongolian. And some of it is even African. They have all types in their people in their DNA. Um, now, according to the standard history, the American Indians were originally primitive food gatherers who gradually worked their way up towards civilization. And the history books I had when I was a kid said that the American Indians living here in the United States were in what we might call the New Stone Age. They were still primitive, but they were climbing slowly upward and would eventually develop a civilization. Recently, though, we have to scratch that view. That, and while well, it's true, these American Indians living in Mexico at the time of Columbus were civilized. The ones living here were civilized. There had been civilizations down in here. Your book mentions them. There also had been numerous civilizations in West today North America. The North American Indians that we found when Columbus arrived were, made, we, were, were much more primitive than their ancestors. In other words, the American Indians living here were descended from advanced Indians who had declined over time and were in an advanced state of decline. And I'm going to suggest, folks, that if the Europeans had not saved them from extinction, they'd probably have become extinct. But the Europeans actually saved them more so than destroyed them. Now, I'll get into why as we progress along. Um, weirdly enough, we're having this lesson on Columbus Day. The actual original Columbus Day was October 12th. Now today it always falls on Monday, and which just happens to be today is Monday. Columbus Day, October 12th. Anyway, um, when Columbus came, these Indians, like I said, were in a state of decline. Columbus, though, is known to have not been the first European to cross the ocean. The first Europeans we have record of to cross were the Vikings, came from Scandinavia. Yes, that's why when you learn where Scandinavia was. The Vikings came from Scandinavia and crossed and discovered Iceland and then came to Greenland and some of them came to Nova Scotia and set up a colony in Nova Scotia. The colony lasted 10 years. Now, the Vikings had 
iron helmets and iron shields and iron swords, which the American Indians did not have. They even had horses. But they were no match for the Indians, and after about 10 years, the Vikings had to get up and leave because the American Indians greatly outnumbered them. Now, that was in the year 1000. Now, fast forward 500 years to the year 1500. By this time, the Europeans had gunpowder, cannon, crude rifles, but rifles nevertheless. They had much heavier armor than the Vikings had, and also kings were involved. And kings meant in armies and navies were involved. And uh, the American Indians were no match in 1500. In the year 1000, yes, the Indians could whip them. Could whip the few Europeans who came over. Uh, 1500, Euro oh yeah, Europeans had much bigger ships also than the Vikings. The Europeans came in such numbers that it just simply overwhelmed the Indians. And the Indians simply did not know it at first, but they didn't have a chance. All right. Um, the American Indians lacked a lot of things. They did not have the horse until the European came. They didn't have the pig, they didn't have the cow. Now this folk is very important. It is known now that persons who raise cattle often develop a community of smallpox. And young girls who milked cows never got smallpox. Your African people had cattle. Your Asian people had cattle. The European people had cattle, so they had resistance to smallpox. When smallpox hit the American Indians, they had no resistance to whatever. Smallpox and typhus largely wiped them out. But they had no cattle. They had uh, only dogs. They did have dogs. They had no pack animals, no camel. The only exception was right here in the western part of <coughs> South America. Some of the Indians had the llama. The llama is related to the camel, or I believe us some be related. The llama is a pack animal, much smaller than a camel, but nevertheless it serves as a pack animal. Uh, so some of them had this, but otherwise they had no domesticated animals except for the dog. And again, some of them had the llama. They did not have the wheel. I wonder why did this, they never invent something as obvious as a wheel, simply because they apparently never felt the need for it. In the area of the grains, they did not have oats, they did not have rye, they did not have wheat, they did not have barley. They were missing a whole lot of the grains. Now, what did they have? Well, they had the potato. And they taught Europeans how to grow potato. The potato, very nutritious food. They also had corn. They taught the West of the world how to grow, we call it maize. Or actually, the correct name is maize, but we call it corn. Now, unfortunately, I mean, corn is easily grown here in this part of the world. It isn't much of the rest of the world, but it's very easily grown here. And it is not at all a very nutritious food. This is what I was some of them in Yet this folk I've been hearing all my life. It is not a nutritious food at all. It's cheap and it's abundant here in the States especially. It is not highly nutritious. How many of you have heard this outside? One of you, okay, just a couple of you. Yeah, yeah it's, it's not nutritious. But they had, the, they had corn. They had, in a way of wild game, they had the deer, the elk, and the turkey, and especially the buffalo. They also had squash, which they made gourds out of. Um, they had pumpkins. They had uh, some plant life. And they did, they did uh, plant crops. Now, now, in studying the American Indians, you don't learn names for until the Europeans came over because they just simply did not care about individual achievement. So when a person died, he was apparently largely forgotten about, and a person had no incentive that way to excel in anything because you would not be remembered, your name would not be remembered after you were gone. So we don't know the names of very many Indians until, until the white man came, and then the white man recorded a lot of the names. So we remember the name Pocahontas, her father's name was Powhatan, her uncle's name was Pechicana. Montezuma, remember him because of Cortez. But otherwise, we don't remember very many names. They uh, didn't uh, have a name. Now,
they had some things so in common with the rest of the world. They observed a seven day a week cycle with the seventh day being a day of rest. They had flood stories. They had stories of a fall from the Garden of Eden. And if you look at the book about the Mayan story of creation, it has a lot of remarkable similarities to the Bible account. That at one time, I mean, here's the Mayan story of creation. The earth was a shoreless ocean, but very, very dry. I mean, not very, it was an ocean that had no shoreline. It was a shoreline. Everything was underwater. And it was all super, super quiet. No waves, no disturbance, and very, very dark. Then the gods got together and they spoke the word. Well, that reminds me of John 1, 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God. That, uh, that the word was spoken, and when the word was spoken, life came about. The land came up out of the water. I mean, remarkably similar. And the date, 4004 BC, is the same date that you would find in the biblical account if you believe biblical dating. Remarkably similar. Um, something else I did not mention this morning class. This right here is called the Yucatan Peninsula. And as some of you may know that the Y in Yucatan is the same as J in other languages. The Bible mentions a man named Joktan. And some scholars believe that Joktan came over here. That there actually was a lot of crossing of the oceans in way, way far, uh, very early times. And Joktan go here and set up a kingdom here and gave his name to this peninsula here. And Joktan is you. There are a whole lot of other place names that you find in the New World. And I have an article about that. If any of you want me to, I can post it online, but uh, it won't be on the test. But a whole lot of place names you find over in the New World that are very similar to place names or names of great people you see on monuments from the Old World, indicating a lot of contact. The American Indians also had the same zodiac with 12 signs and symbols. The same zodiac you'll find in the rest of the world indicating that somewhere way back there they had things in common. Now the language, some words among the American Indian languages are the same as some European words. Again, indicating a certain type of content. Or well, also words over here. But American Indian languages are said to not be related to languages elsewhere. I'm not sure, though, that they, you can um, say that for sure. The American Indians were great builders. Right here in Mexico and Central America, they built a lot of pyramids. Here, they built a lot of mounds. Yes, there are Indian mounds here in Georgia. And my wife and I just happened to go to one back in June. They had, I've been to it 30 years before. They had Achota Indian Mounds. I mean, have any of you ever seen the Achota, New Achota Indian Mounds? Just off the I 75 near Cartersville. About a 40 mile trip, one way. Uh, worth your while to see it. They, they were mound builders. But unlike the Europeans, they tended to not use stone in building their very large structures. They tended to use dirt. And uh, that's why, I mean, okay, the biggest pyramid in the world is not the Pyramid of Giza, it's the tallest. The pyramid of Jesus is taller and it's made of stone. But the pyramid at Copan, the pyramid at Copan is more massive. But it, when, when we don't have any mystery about how it was built, it was made of dirt. The mystery though is how did those people carry all that dirt to one place? Even if they had wheelbarrow barrows, even if they had which they didn't, if they just carried it on their backs. How did they get all that dirt in one place and raise it up? But apparently they did. Uh, but they, um, they were astronomers also, and they had an extremely accurate calendar. The Maya in particular, and I'm going to write more of that down later, but well, the Maya, I'll put that name down now. The Maya were really fascinated with planet Venus. Now, if you get up before sunrise, like I do three times a week, Mondays and Wednesdays and Fridays, and you look toward the rising sun, about an hour or two before the sun comes up, you'll see a really, really bright star from the horizon. That's Venus. Any of you know what I'm talking about? Uh, one of you at least, yeah. That bright, bright star that rises up ahead of the sun. Now, eventually the Venus will fall behind the sun and um, 
Venus actually is still there. I mean, I, when the sun comes up, Venus disappears. And it's, it's still there. But you can't see it because the sun is so bright that, that the light of the sun scatters throughout the atmosphere such that it blots out Venus. Now, if you get in the right conditions, the astronomers know how to see it. But uh, they were, had a fast night for Venus. Now, while other people were making solar calendars, calendars of the sun, which is what we go by, the sun calendar, or making a moon calendar, the Mayans made a Venus calendar that was based on the planet Venus. Now, folks, this is going to sound weird. I cannot quite prove what I say, but I have read it. The planet Venus is the only planet in the solar system where the sun rises in the west and sets in the east. We did not know that when I was a kid. In fact, we didn't find that out until about 19, sometime in the late 1960s, early 70s, that the sun rises. In fact, we did not know the rotational period of Venus. Venus does rotate on its axis. It does not always keep it the same face of the sun. Did the Mayans know this? I can't prove it. If they did, they knew a lot more about Venus than, than we could have. Yes? What would we need to believe that they knew something about it? The way they constructed the calendar. The cal right, granted, you can make a calendar of anybody in the solar system. I mean, you can observe Venus and say, well, all right, when Venus rises right with the sun, we'll call it a new Venus month. When Venus, Venus rises behind the sun, we'll call that an older month. When Venus is ahead of the sun, also, but see, Venus, my mother went for a lot of while about to realize that the morning star and evening star, when Venus is behind the sun, you won't see it until the sun goes down. Then you'll see it in the western sky behind the sun. So you can make a calendar. Now, how would they have known? They could not have known unless they had, had some way to penetrate Venus's clouds. They could not have known. But the significance of it, again, you can make a calendar from anybody in the solar system that you can see. You can make a Mars calendar. But in case of Venus, I mean, if, again, for a while it will rise ahead of the sun. Then it gets like even with the sun when you can't see it. Then it falls behind the sun. When it falls behind the sun, you can only see it right after the sun goes down in the western sky. And uh, for some time, a lot of primitive people did not know that this morning star and evening star were the same star. Europeans were slow about learning that, and finally some astronomers said, hey, the morning star and evening star is the same star, it's the planet Venus. All right, um, oh yes, in Ohio, where I came from, there's a 10 mile long rattlesnake. Not coiled, but it has a head on one end and rattles on the other. What? Nobody recognized it as a rattlesnake until they flew over an airplane and said, hey, this is artificial. I mean, you can see from the ground it was a mound. This is artificial. Now, folks, you might not realize this. To build a 10-mile rattlesnake, you have to know a lot of geometry, I mean, to get it right. I mean, it's one thing for a kid to take a bunch of clay and form a little snake, you know. 10 miles from one head to toe, to where you, from the head you can't see the tail, from the tail you can't see the head. That takes some geometry. I'll have more to say about that in a little bit. But, when we get to the South America Nazca lines. All right, the earliest civilization we know about in the New World is the Olmec. Maybe you haven't heard of it, but several years ago, some students around this school got excited. There was some research done that indicated that the Olmec civilization was actually African in origin. Their mask and their statues showed very distinct African features. And, and they also made statues of tigers which are not native to the region of Central America or the New World at all, that which they could not have made had they not seen the tiger from somewhere. It almost appears like the Olmecs crossed the Atlantic and settled right here and bought some of their culture with them from Africa. And we have not studied Olmec DNA that I know of, but it might prove one way or another that the Olmecs were from Africa. We have found African DNA among American Indian peoples, though. The Olmecs did write 
but their writing has not been deciphered owing to the fact that there's not enough of it. They have some writings on some of their statues and small inscriptions. Unless we find a book or something that has a lot of writing, we'll probably never decipher the Olmec writing. We know that they traded, they built temples, they built pyramids, and then around the 300 spoke, they disappeared suddenly. What went wrong? I'm going to offer a theory. When the Olmecs disappeared, about the same time Rome was declining, China was declining, India was declining, why would not the Olmecs have declined also? According to my theory, it was all caused by one thing, a climate cooling. But again, now you, other people suspected it about uh, Rome, about China, But a climate change might have also affected even as far south as Mexico, owing to what some people suspected that the, uh, the cold gets farther south here than it does in a lot of other places in the world. It's like there's a path to where the cold comes down through here and uh, gets, again, gets farther south than other places in the world. It's, it like forms a path and doesn't just simply come down evenly. Um, again, what I've just said, I cannot prove, but nevertheless, you can always speculate. Anyway, the Olmecs suddenly disappear. Now, I'm going to pronounce this word, Teotihuacan. Khan. I don't know if it's pronounced right or not. If any of you know how to, It's called, and any of you have seen this word before, I believe it's pronounced Teotihuacan, I've heard it pronounced. It's called America's first metropolis, uh, T-E-O-T-I-H-U-A-C-A-N. It lasted a thousand years, or about that long. It was a manufacturing center, a trade center, in other words, both these people were not permanent. They became that way, some of them. Unfortunately, what we know about, we don't know this for sure, well, actually I think we suspect about the Olmecs, but we do know it about the Otakon, they practiced human sacrifice. That was to be a big issue all the way down through their history of their civilization, whether it be Olmec, Teotihuacan, the Zapotec, I don't mention the Zapotec, but they were there, and the Maya, all of them practiced human sacrifice. And they were and the Aztec. They were still doing that when the Europeans arrived. And it was one of the things that made the Europeans feel justified in conquering them. That these people were untamed and uncivilized. Alright, while I'm thinking about it. Ludovic. Oh, okay, okay. Shane Arthur. Uh, Jose Taylor. Liz, Isaac. Gee, oh, oh, my bad, my bad, my bad, my bad. Clark Curry, I mean, uh, Tank, Tarek, Inez, Chantel, Chantel Knight, Gazis, Juan, Alexander, Israel, Rebecca. Okay, if I didn't call your name, you weren't present. All right, the Maya. I've already got that name on the board. The white man did not destroy the Mayan civilization. <coughs> the Mayans were largely destroyed as a civilization long before the, Euro <coughs> the Europeans arrived. Now, the Mayans were not completely destroyed. They still exist. But they no longer are a nation. They're no longer independent. They, were, they had abandoned their major cities. Now, folk, this is something that... Uh, I've talked about a little bit, and we'll talk about some more. Sometimes you'll be, I mean, we've explored and found in the middle of a jungle a huge, huge city. Oh, this that's completely, totally abandoned. Now you know the snakes and the lizards and the wild animals. And nobody knows who originally lived there. But by the time the Europeans arrived, they had abandoned their bigger cities, and they were living in smaller towns. Um, but they had nine books 
Of these nine books, the Spanish destroyed five of them. Four still survive. When I visited Capon in 1976, I said to myself, when they deciphered the Mayan writings, knew with the aid of computers they would, because they had a lot of them. <clears throat> also, they knew the Mayan language. Anyway, scholars began to work deciphering the Mayan language. And when I did, I started reading, and I said, I don't want to read any more of this. All right, the Mayan language had been deciphered by a Spanish priest when the Spanish first came over. And this priest had showed his buddies what it, the Mayans said, and the Spanish decided this is the work of demons. And they destroyed five of the nine books. Somehow four of them survived. Why did I not care about reading them? Because the Mayans told of the spells they used to conjure up demons and how they would go into a trance-like state and contact the spirit world by letting out the blood out of the bodies until they started hallucinating. And they believed that what they saw in a state of hallucination was uh, the gods speaking to them. Um, I must say this, 90 to 95% of the world have believed that there are demon entities floating around nearby us, including Socrates, by the way. The Muslims call them genie. Christians call them demons. Um, you can believe what you will, but the Mayans believe strongly in these spirit beings, and they tried to contact them. And like I say, when I started reading about this bloodletting and the contact with spirits, I said, no, I don't have any more. Even though, remarkably, their creation story is a lot like the one found in Genesis and in the, first, I mean, in the book of John, about how the word of the gods created the universe, created the world. That's in John 1.1. 1, 1. Also in Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. Uh, because Genesis doesn't call it the word. John does. Um, now, the Mayans were, again, astronomical. Um, unfortunately, the Mayans practiced human sacrifice. Now, when I visited the city of Capon, yeah, I wrote that name. When I visited Capon in 1976, I saw the ball court. They used some of the trees nearby to make a rubber ball. And they would try to get this rubber ball across the goal line. We don't know much about the rules of the game. What we do know about the game, though, is the losers of the games, the losing team, was sacrificed. If that didn't give you all kinds of incentive to win and to cheat like everything, I mean, nothing would. But the idea was you get that ball somehow across the goal line more than the other team does. Um, their cities were built around a pyramid. And near the pyramid were uh, temples, palaces, and of course a ball court. All their cities had a ball court. And palaces and a pyramid. The palaces, the temples were where their gods lived, and their holy places. The palaces were where their kings lived. And the ball court was where they played their games, of course. Um, again, then comes a big mystery. The Maya appear to have declined suddenly, again, before the white man came. The fact is that in a lot of the Mayan cities, there's a whole lot of buildings that they started to build and never finished, unfinished buildings. Now, back in the year 2008, we saw in America a lot of buildings that started to build that were abandoned. I mean, I on my way home, I passed by two shopping centers, one of which was eventually finished, the other of which was never finished. It started to make things. They got the framework up, the structure, got some electric work in, and all of a sudden they quit. And you know what I'm talking about. The economy took a turn south. In the case of the Maya, we don't know why they say decline. It appears the decline was sudden. Their favorite among environmentalists is that they over-farmed the land. And in a farming, they cut away, hacked away with their machetes, hacked away at the rainforest, and cut too much of the rainforest. And this brought about a decline because the rainforest, they didn't realize that the rainforest was a plant and animal cycle, so you destroy a certain type of plant, and it destroys a whole lot of the cycles. Same way as it destroys a certain animal, and it'll take that 
you might say that player out of the game. Um, but if it were not the rain forced, it might have been that they had rebellion among themselves or wars and external invasions. It might even have been a volcano erupted. Um, whatever. The Mayans be, uh, they did not become extinct, but their large cities were abandoned. And all they lived in was small towns. After the Maya died out came the Aztecs. These were the people who were in power when Cortez visited. Now, it was most fortunate for the Europeans that when the, when the Spanish arrived, the Spanish first bumped into some islands, you might say. Well, they had an easy time taking over the islands. They used the islands as a base of operation against the mainland. Now, perhaps if, Cor if Columbus had missed the islands and bumped into Mexico first, who knows, the Indians might have driven a white man out. As it was, the uh, Spanish had the good fortune of hitting the islands first, taking over the islands, building up cities and military bases on the islands. Then the Indians told the white man there's a big, large empire just to the west of you. Cortez believed the Indians. He took some 200 men, and they landed in Mexico, and Cortez said to his men, all right, men, turn around and burn our ships. We're either going to conquer Mexico or we're going to die. It reminds me of Julius Caesar when he burned his bridges. Cortez burned his ships. Now, how could Cortez, with a mere 200 men, conquer Montezuma, who had an army of 100,000 men? There's about four reasons your book gives. Reason number one was the Aztecs were just fearful. They believed that the white man were gods. And especially when they saw a white man on a horseback, and a white man on a horse had a hard shell of armor. They believed the armor was his exoskeleton like arthropods have a hard exoskeleton. They believe the horse and the rider were one person with two heads. Horse and rider, one person. Also, the white man had artillery, had cannon and gunpowder, which the Indians did not have. But there is some other reason, even more important. Cortez learned that a lot of Montezuma's subjects were discontented with his rule. And they told Cortez, all right, Cortez had a young woman with him who had the gift of learning languages really fast. And she learned Spanish like lightning. I'm not talking about me. I mean, I took three years of Spanish in high school and college, and I can barely say, como estar usted. <laughs> Some of you might know what that means. Anyway. Um, but she had the gift of learning, and she was able to interpret for Cortez and Cortez learned that a lot of these Mexicans were discontent, particularly when Montezuma would send out his tax collector. The tax collector took anything they wanted, including their wives and daughters, to so be used as sex slaves. And Cortez said, hey, if you'll join my army, we'll, de we'll defeat this Montezuma. So Cortez collected an army of tens of thousands of American Indians. And when it came to a showdown, half of Montezuma's army would not fight. Now, without meaning to, Cortez also used germ warfare. Cortez and his men carried diseases like smallpox and typhoid fever, which they did not have, but apparently they were carriers. <laughs> and these diseases were destined to wipe out 90% of the Indian population. Well, Cortez met Montezuma, and I've already mentioned how that Cortez once heard some hideous scream from Tim Poniaskis, interpreted, what's me these screams, interpreter said, oh, these are people being offered to sacrifice the keys of Kogel, our sun god. Cortez turned to Montezuma and said, your gods are not gods, but devils. This was translated, and of course, peacekeepers moved in on both sides to try to say, well, it's an error in translation. You've lost something in the translation. He didn't really say this and tried to tone down what Cortez actually said. But nevertheless, Cortez was convinced that these people had to be conquered and the sacrifices stopped. Again, because of his religious beliefs. I'm not saying Cortez was by any means a devout Christian, but his beliefs came from Christian principles that human sacrifice was wrong. Um, yes? How do you spell Montezuma? All right, I'm glad you asked. It's to spell two ways, but I'm going to put this one. Sometimes it's spelled M O C, 
Moctezuma, or sometimes M-O-N. I do not know if we know which is correct. By the way, the Aztecs started out apparently somewhere up here in what is the day New Mexico. And uh, they apparently were at one time a weak tribe. They grew bigger and bigger, and they were a highly aggressive tribe and very warlike. Reminds me of Dingus Pond, who's they made them, they got powerful making tree, by making treaties with their neighbors, like Dingus Khan did. Then they started conquering tribes one at a time, and eventually built up an empire that included all of Mexico. Um, Anyway, to make a long story short, Cortes destroyed Montezuma's empire. Montezuma himself was killed. Then Cortes took over, and he enslaved all the Indians around, including the ones who had helped him, the ones who had befriended him. He looked on them all as being heathen and evil. He, he did bring in missionaries to try to convert them, and in a lot of cases, the conversions were forceful, forced conversions. Um, again, this is part of the uh, story of man's attempt to get <coughs> along with the Indians. <coughs> right. Moving on. Sorry about my coughing, but I'll eventually recover. The Incas. The Incas lived in what is today Peru. A group of Spanish came here and they heard that there was a sea to the south, so Balboa kept on, every time he'd climb him, just get to a mountain, he'd tell his man, you stay back here, I want to be the first person to see it. He'd go to the top of the mountain, look at the top, well, no sea there, but it's only 50 miles wide here. Eventually, eventually, he uh, climbed a mountain and looked over, and there it was. There was the big ocean, which he called the South Sea because here it is, the South. But anyway, um, Balboa died. So the climb was harsh. Pizarro moved in to uh, and, uh, set up a small village in Inca territory. Then the Incas started fighting among themselves, and Pizarro and the Spanish took advantage of it. And they had guns and horses and armor, and they conquered the Inca Empire. The Inca chief, to the Inca king, said, I can fill this room I'm in with half full of gold as high as I can reach. Now the Inca chieftain was a tall man and the room was the size of a classroom. So if you can imagine someone filling a room from here over as high as a man can reach with gold. The Spanish didn't believe there was that much gold anywhere. But anyway, the Inca chieftain did fill the room half full of gold. And two things we don't know. Number one, where did that gold come from? To this day, folks, we don't know. We know where it went. The Spanish took it back to Europe and it replenished the gold that had been lost in Europe centuries before. Essentially, the white men stole the gold from the Indians. Then Pizarro had the Inca chieftain killed anyway. Pizarro was later killed by one of his own men, paid for his treachery. I want to elaborate though on the Incas a little bit. And unfortunately, they were conquered. The Inca are still around. The Inca practiced terrace farming. You know, they lived a high in the Andes Mountains. And terrace farming means they would take a mountain slope and level it at a certain place, then come down here and level it again, and um, farm in layers called terraces. They'd farm here in this flat, and this flat, and this flat, and they practiced a lot of terrace farming. They built a city of Cusco, C-U-S-C-O, The city of Cusco is 11,000 feet in the air. And folk, I just looked this up before came. I mean, I've heard other stories that Cusco is actually tall higher in the air than that. We do not know how the large stones that were used in the building of Cusco were moved that high up the mountain. We know the stones were quarried from way below. <laughs> how they get, I mean, at 11,000 feet, well, persons living on the ground cannot go 11,000 feet without taking days to get there. Your body has to adjust to the lack of oxygen. How did they get the stones up there? Big mystery. The stones are large. No two stones in the city of Cusco are alike, and yet they all fit together like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle, interlinking stones. They don't even need mortar. And the stones hold together and have held to this day. Um, Yes. Cusco is a city, sorry, I missed that. It's a city of the Incas. 
And it's today one of South America's biggest tourist attractions. And it was, the Incas called it officially the tourist capital of, I mean, the, from it, Peru called it the tourist capital of Peru. And it's called the classical capital of Peru to this day, even though their actual capital of Peru today is Lima. But um, Cusco has uh, about 100,000 people living there. Um, all right. Now, other Indians, the Arawak, A-R-A-W-A-K. They lived in what is today the Caribbean. In other words, this sea right along here, Caribbean, sometimes pronounced Caribbean, or Caribbean. Um, the Spanish destroyed all of the Arawak Indians until they're extinct. Now, I say that tongue in cheek because when you examine the DNA of the Indians left here, 60% of the people here can have DNA that contains some elements of Arawak DNA or what's known to be Arawak DNA. So now officially the Arawak are extinct, but some of their descendants are still around but under different names. As was the case of a lot of American Indians, the Arawak had their women equal to their men. They did not believe in male supremacy. This was true, by the way, of a lot of the Indians here in North America. And one of the reasons the Indians in North America did not want to convert to Christianity was that Christianity teaches that women should be subservient to their husbands, and we don't believe that. Um, but the Arawak had equality between men and women. Now, if you think I'm pausing and hesitating, I mean, I've said this in three or four classes in a row. I had one of the female pupils quit. I don't know. Folk, your authors do not ever say this in any one place. But if you read what the authors say about women in this chapter, in this chapter, in this chapter, in this chapter, this chapter, without them, I don't think they mean to, but they wind up saying that the more equal the women are, the more primitive the society, the more society is likely to become extinct. It's in the book, folks, but not in any one place. Yes? Well, it, I don't think it means that um, men and women should be unequal in, like, in quality or whatever, but more just having different jobs. I believe that. Different What's roles. That? Different in roles, society. different roles. And so, uh, like, the feminist see, movement kind of wants to bring. And it, put women serving in the army in combat. Sorry, go ahead. I didn't know you. Go ahead. Well, I just meant like a lot of, from what I understand, the feminist movement kind of wants to say that, oh, if women can't do the same job that men do, then they're not equal. And that's kind of silly. Well, but. Okay, when I was in the Army, we had their long marches. And I was 30 years old, and I knew enough to, if I was going to complete a 15 mile march with a backpack, I'd better pace myself. These two young women just passed me up, just laughing up a storm. They were going, oh yeah, they were, and I thought, well, I'm a man, they're a woman. Here they are, packing up a cook. Oh, we got two hundred yards down, and you can guess the rest of the story. Those two women were crying their eyes out, and they didn't open that. Less than a year ago, I had my daughter do the same thing. We went, me and my two daughters on the bike ride, and my second daughter took off on her bicycle, pale mail, like, and be you know, 65 years old, I knew I better, that's how much older I knew. I better pace myself up on my pace this trail. My daughter got about a mile down the road and she broke down. Right. Now, I do believe, folks, that women, well, here's why I think that the people who got it right more than any other, so the Europeans who said, yes, women should be under subjection, but women should also be respected and honored for being women. They when Europeans honored highly the Virgin Mary. European knights had a code of chivalry where you they taught honor and respect for women. Um, hey, the Chinese killed their female babies. I want to say I mean oh I disagree. I think it's terrible. But they next to the Europeans they can achieve the second highest culture of any group. At least the men were in I mean I feel like 
I feel bad about saying this book, but I mean, it's there. The Indian people here, they told their wives that when their husbands die, you're going to burn yourself in a fire. Throw yourself in a fire and burn yourself. We both, I disagree with that horribly. Yet they were high achievers. The Muslims believed that women were property. For a long time, they were high achievers. The primitive peoples of the world, the ones who said women are evil. I mean, I'm married and I have two daughters and a son. I believe women should be respected and honored. Anyone else? I mean, if anyone wants to comment. It's history, folk. It's there. You might not like it. If you don't like it, I'm not saying I like it. It's just what I have observed. I dated two women who were involved in the feminist movement and they both turned me super hard against Yes. Neither, well, anyway, one of them never married. Go ahead. What about what you're saying, like the Mayans and the Aztecs, these, you know, incredible things that they did? With they did not practice female equality. The Arawak did. They were a tribal primitive people. All right, now, something I want to mention, I'm running out of time fast, and I'll, I probably won't get started on this on, on first thing on Wednesday, the Nazca Lines. Now, folk, your book shows a picture of them. Some of the Nazca Lines are in the shape of birds or other animals. Some of them are very, very straight lines, and we have no idea how the people could get the line. I mean, folk, you cannot walk in a straight line. This is known. If you start walking and you're lost, you're eventually going to walk in a circle unless you have some reference point to keep you straight. This is something taught us in the army. This is very true. Well, even your authors, I mean, this is probably, authors even suggest in the book that some people have said that the Nazca lines were built by aliens or directed by people who operated from vantage point of a space station high above and had radio contact with people on Earth who built the lines and told them where to move. This is in your book, even. I mean, if you don't believe it, Read it. It's there. The aliens even. I mean, the authors mention alien, possible alien. But they don't they don't they don't subscribe to it. They just mention that a lot of persons have said that. Not that I believe it myself. I believe that they that they were built by humans who had more advancement and more geometry than we give them credit for. They were not initially primitive. They became that way. But initially they were very highly advanced. Which brings me back to the North American Indians. Here is the problem with the Indians living where we in America are today. In one word, they lived in communes. All right, we call them villages, which is another way of saying commune. The North American Indians folk were communists. They had everything that Karl Marx called for. They had no private ownership of property. They had no money. They had no social classes. Everybody was equal. And everybody got fed and clothed alike. The non-productive and lazy and shiftless and non-caring got the same amount of food as a hard worker. Nobody then had any incentive to better himself. So what was the result? their population dwindled, and this is the problem you have under communism. And North American Indian women did not like to have children. They averaged about one or two babies per woman. And their population dwindled and dwindled and dwindled and dwindled. Folk, I don't see how they could have kept from becoming extinct if the white man had not come along and perhaps saved them from extinction. But one of the main reasons they lost, it wasn't they didn't have guns. I mean, they eventually got the guns from the white man. They eventually got the horses. They became excellent horsemen, became excellent riders, excellent sharpshooters even, learned how to use the rifles. But they didn't have the numbers. Now, there was something else they had. Right, this past weekend, I went to my wife's family and my wife is from a family who was part of the last Indian massacre, the Wilds family. The massacre occurred at Wake Forest. Four boys survived. My wife is descended from one of the boys who survived. 
the rest of the family, including the baby and my father and mother, were all there. The four young boys were able to escape through the thickets and get away from the Indians. But Billy Bowlegs was the Indian chieftain who was probably responsible for death. And he was surrounded by his warriors. And I didn't say soldiers. You don't think of American Indian fighters as being soldiers. They were warriors, yes. What's the difference between a soldier and a warrior? Anybody know? Fight for themselves. A warrior fights for himself. A soldier fights as a team for his buddies. That's a huge difference. The American Indians would get in a battle, and if they saw if someone was coming after who was a little bit bigger, they would turn and run. But they'd pick on someone on their own side, they'd fight with him till one of them finished off the other. Then they'd go the winner would look around and see if there's somebody else who was his own size who would fight. They didn't fight like the Greek hoplites where everybody protected his buddy. Your buddy protected you and you protected your buddy. They didn't fight like the whole fights. They were fighters, they were brave. They're called braves, yes, like the Atlanta brave. But they were not, they were not soldiers. And what was the result? Their cultural level went to zero, or near zero. They had once been highly advanced, though. Communism was responsible. And the white man came in and conquered. Now, if you disagree with that, I'm out of time. Take it up with me one Wednesday. Have a good time.